Hello, everyone. It happens every day in the workplace. People get stuck, stuck thinking inside the box, using the same sol problem solving techniques, relying on traditional solutions. How do you make the box bigger? How do you show them there is no box? Would you know where to start? Would you know what to do? My name is Rakesh Srivastava. Well, today with my colleague, Mike Pearsall, we are going to introduce you to a process that will do exactly that. Good morning and welcome everyone to Value Management in Action, Fostering Innovation. During this presentation, we'll share with you what successes we experienced as part of our involvement in Ontario Ministry of Transportation, Value Analysis Canada, what challenge we faced and what valuable lessons we learned as part of our value management delivery in Ontario and Canada. And also we'll bring you some real examples to share with you as well. So just a little bit about ourselves. So as uh, Natasha mentioned, I serve on the board of director of uh, Ontario, board of director of uh, Value Analysis Canada over 18 years working in Ontario Ministry of Transportation and Metrolinx, part of the uh, transit agency, value management, the role in value management over 16 years, and board also the Federal British Corporation Limited, part of Government of Canada. And Mike and I were all both recognized by the Ontario Public Service uh, Amethyst Award. And I'm Mike Pearsall. I've spent the bulk of my career working for the Ontario Ministry of Transportation for over 29 years. Through MTO, I was exposed to the value methodology a little over 24 years ago, and I have been a certified value specialist for the past 16 years. In this time, I have also served as a board member with both Value Analysis Canada and Save International, both of which I will tell you a little bit more about momentarily. I am currently serving as the president of Save International. This is the first time anyone in the OPS has had this opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. Let me briefly tell you about the two value societies relevant to Canada. First, SAVE International is the premier international society devoted to advancing and promoting the value methodology globally. One of the important aspects of SAVE is the certification program for practitioners, which is internationally utilized and recognized. SAVE administers this global program for certified value specialists and value methodology associates. In Canada, we also have Value Analysis Canada, a nonprofit society dedicated to helping Canadians stay competitive by improving value in their projects, processes, and products through application of the value methodology. Rakesh is currently on the board of Value Analysis Canada, and I have been a past president for Value Analysis Canada. Both societies have an inter-society agreement and use the SAVE certification program. This year, we have a unique opportunity in Ontario with an OPS employee volunteering as president of SAVE and another on the board of Value Analysis Canada, giving us excellent ties to both value societies and their network of members. Canadians board this year to the benefit of all of Canada. How can we help you take advantage? Rakesh, back to you. So let, let us share with you our national and international recognition, part of our involvement in Ontario Ministry of Transportation, advancement of value management and bringing that team together, a word of merit when we reach over eight years ago, advancement and the cost avoidance and the saving of over 1 billion. Amethyst Award, our team will recognize part of delivering that value management within that over 20 years bringing that cost avoidance, savings, uh, and added uh, value to the project. So why value management? And what is it? Value management, also known as value analysis and value engineering, it's a facilitated and creative process. It generates alternative solutions. It involves people from different variety of backgrounds. What it does, it balances both features and cost by defining what value is and the method to improve it, improve value further. This is done in number of phases, we're gonna talk about later. And this is not something new. 
value management has been around for a very, very long time, since World War II, actually. It was developed to meet a crisis shortage of war materials. And going back to our home, 1995, MTO was facing some kind of problem solving situation, and we started using value management. Let me share with you what it is not. There's a lot of mis myth and misperception about value management. This is not just a good design or suggested program or routine project review or peer review, or it's not a cost reduction exercise. Again, this is a facilitated and creative process that generates alternative solutions and involves people that come together from variety of backgrounds. So simply put, value is a personal perspective of your willingness to pay for what the function you're getting. So performance delivered by a product, it can be a service, it can be process, or it can be a project. So what it does, it balances both features and cost by defining what value is. It means achieving most outcome with the same resource, or achieving same outcome with the least resource possible, achieving best value for money. Value management MTO and our uh, Ontario Ministry of Transportation, there are many successful stories in leading the way of reducing cost and adding value. And those have resulted in national and international recognition. A number of stories and proven results are all in public domain. You all can access. Some of the examples could be business process improvements, some of the innovative ideas, collaboration with our partners, agencies, project performance, safety, a number of other examples. And this is not about only dollar and cents. It's also about number of other benefits such as the schedule, risk, and other added value, which you cannot only compare in dollar and cents. Let me share with you one of the snapshot, what you see on the screen, and the noun is the year. So close to the over 20 year cycle, you see, and the numbers on the right side, cost avoidance and saving on the cumulative value of over $1.4 billion and it keeps rising. But this graphic does not show lots of other things, which is beyond dollar and cents, which is improvement to schedule, improvement to risk, a stakeholder alignment, multi-agency, our partners, municipality, competing interest, how many times we have competing interest in a number of projects, Employee engagement, when they all come from different variety of background and contribute to the solutions and overall fostering innovation. Those, though these results are for the Ministry of Transportation, I want to clarify that these were not just highway projects. M2O has successfully applied the methodology to equipment, such as our award-winning snow removal equipment conspicuity study, it has been applied to transit projects and internationally I can bring up such ones as Sound Transit 62 miles of new LRT that they did over on the West Coast of the United States. We also have used it on service centers and various buildings. You know, and I mentioned transit earlier, however, I should note that transit stations are an excellent candidate for buildings for the methodology to be applied and many agencies have done so. Next slide, please. In addition, the methodology is applicable to not just capital projects. We have used it successfully for organizational change and revisions to business processes. We have looked at highway operations and maintenance, everything from collision prone locations to the application of anti-icing chemicals. We have also successfully applied it to a number of IT projects. The methodology works quite well to scope out new software for development. In most of Canada, and particularly here in Ontario, this has all been on what we will call a largely voluntary basis. 
Around the world, some countries have policies mandating use of the methodology. A nearby example would be in the United States, where the Office of Management and Budget has what's called OMB Circular A131, mandating use on certain federal projects. As re the by releasing a memo directing agencies to show performance metrics to back up their budget requests. They take this very seriously in the federal government. Another good example would be in the United Kingdom where they have a cabinet office policy titled Management of Value and their value society, the Institute of Value Management provides training on how to apply it. Personally, I went to the effort a couple of years ago of writing the Management of Value exam and obtaining that certification as well as I wanted to fully understand the UK approach and how we can apply some of it here in Canada. Next slide, please. Changing gears here a bit, we want to tell you a little more about the methodology. The process takes place in a structured workshop setting. Overall, there are eight steps. However, today we will highlight the middle six in detail as shown here, which takes place during the main workshop. Next slide, please. At the beginning of the workshop, there is the information phase. This phase is all about the team reviewing all of the available project information, becoming familiar with the project and discussing it. This is where we'll ask probing questions about the project and try to clearly define the objectives, any issues, concerns, or key constraints. Next slide, please. Next, there's the function analysis phase. This phase is the key aspect to the methodology and really what sets it apart from all competitors. At this stage, we want to answer the question, what must it do? What is the basic function and what other functions are involved? I will show you a simple example in a minute, but basically we like to take you back to, to your elementary school basics and describe functions using verb noun pairs like support or data have many functions and we group them in a functional diagram to relate. Function analysis allows you to step to a higher level of abstraction as you will see short to explore more alternatives and better understand what is being studied. Next slide please. To illustrate this concept we will briefly look at a standard pencil such as I have here and you can see on the screen. Consider for a moment what is the basic function of a pencil? When I ask this question, most people say it is to write something. However, that is more of an action by the user. I could look at this pencil for many years, study it, I could have a bunch of pencils here and none of them will actually write something. In terms of function, the basic function of a pencil is to make marks on a surface or simply mark the surface. For this, all you really need is the graphite in the tip. However, as you can see, there are other parts to even a standard pencil, such as this eraser and the little grip here that holds it on, and it might even be the advertising here, in this case for the Ontario egg farmers I've got in this pencil. If we go to the next slide, please. Looking at the whole pencil, in addition to the basic function, there are some secondary functions of the components of a pencil. The eraser has a function to remove marks. The band has a function to secure the eraser. The wood barrel has a few functions, such as to support the lead, accommodate grip, and transmit force. Similarly, the paint can both protect the wood and improve the appearance. Next, I'd like to look at another common item now and for something more complex. Next slide, please. Here we have a common wooden mousetrap, something you have likely walked past hundreds of times in store checkouts. It's about unless you really needed one. Below the picture, we have what is called a fast diagram, which is a way of organizing the functions for something by asking the basic questions of how and why, and occasionally the question when. I think we would all agree that the higher order function of a mousetrap is to eliminate mice. 
We place that to the left of the diagram. Next, we ask, how are we going to eliminate mice? In this case, we have a standard wooden trap. So with apologies to any mouse advocates out there, the basic function of the wooden trap is to kill the mouse. Continuing on, we ask, how does it kill the mouse? By swinging the striker. At the same time, we release the spring. How do we swing the striker? We trigger the striker. How do we trigger the striker? We attract the mouse. How do we attract the mouse? We hold bait. Similarly, we can check our logic at any stage by asking the question why and going the opposite direction from right to left. Why does it hold bait? To attract the mouse. Why does it attract the mouse? To trigger the striker and ultimately to kill the mouse. Now, to be technically correct for any function aficionados out there, some of these boxes today are more actions than functions. We have taken some liberties with this to make it a simple example, easy to quickly illustrate. And in practice, sometimes you have to do this during a study. Um, in a real technical study or real workshop, we might have more general functions like store energy and release torque, depending on the audience for the diagram. Now, we have all of these functions figured out and related in a diagram. Comes, I will turn you on part. So let me ask you, how many people have considered themselves creative? You don't have to raise hand, you can think that answer to yourself. I'll ask two more questions. How many people believe that creativity just happens and it comes upon you without thinking about it? And the last question, how many people believe that there are only certain people who can be creative? And that is not part of everyone. I'm sure you chose one or part of who you belong to. But let, let us share with you from the value management perspective. Many people don't consider themselves in reality being creative, but we all can be, regardless of our professional background or hierarchy in the organization. There are many myths about creativity and the questions posed are all met. And the creative phase is all about generating ideas. Everyone has the capacity to be creative. And to generate ideas and alternative solutions that may improve a product or service or solve a problem. So creative phase is all about creating ideas. And Mike talked about function, which is one of the most important part of this. And second only to the function analysis, this is importance to the value management and can be the most fun as well. So let me share with you the simple example Mike talked about pencil and mousetrap. How do you store the information? Some people will store this way. Some people choose to store other way. Some people choose other way and different way in electronic side. Some people choose to keep it to themselves. So this just show you where Mike and I are bringing simple examples to you. So if that can be applied in simple, a dollar project, it can be applied to a, in this situation, it can apply to multi-million dollar project or multi-billion dollar projects. It's all about alternative solutions. For example, that can be in infrastructure, bridge, infrastructure, stations, products, processes, and so on that creativity of ideas. And what is, why it is successful? Creative phase becomes successful because it's a diverse point of view and there's open discussion. What it does, it pull away from the expected solutions. It encourages more ideas, as many as possible. Because at this point, we do not judge any idea at this point. We're encouraging to have that more idea as possible. And after we're done with the creative phase, we move on to the evaluation. So idea for creative phase, because we had so many ideas, we don't, didn't judge at that point, we generated all kinds of ideas. So evaluation fed does evaluating them and looking at the potential. What are those potential of those ideas to save cost and also adding value? And adding value means 
looking from the schedule perspective, risk, constructability, and so on. So the next step becomes, it can be done in a number of ways, idea comparison, voting or discussion uh, based on the uh, value management team we work with. And after ideas are evaluated, we go explore in details. Each idea is selected from the evaluation phase. What happens, they consider as a worthwhile pursuing or not. This may include creating some kind of a sketch, calculating cost, identifying advantage, disadvantage, and is this the alternative better than the proposed solution? Does the schedule allow for the, it happen? Does it achieve the necessary functions? And we develop them in the detail. And the end part of the uh, workshop, it is a presentation. We compile all information and present that. The presentation of the recommendation happens, what is made to the owners, the stakeholders, decision makers, and that demonstrates a depth of analysis. And that also inspires confidence in the work, what we have done. This is a frankly opportunity to present the result of the study. And the credibility of the ideas comes from how well the team presents the alternative solution and it responds to the questions, challenges, and the serious clarification to make it better. And then after that, it goes to the implementation phase and goes back to the project team. So why should you implement value methodology at your agency, business, or company? The number one reason is that all projects, products, and processes have unnecessary costs associated with them. Yes, you will hear people say, we already do that. It's just good engineering. We don't need it. We have a good quality assurance system and similar statements. The fact is that they're not telling you the truth. I have run workshops on many well-engineered things that went through a rigorous design and QA QC process. However, over time, there is scope creep, risk mitigation, and good intentions that burden a product, a project, or process. This applies whether you are manufacturing widgets or building linear infrastructure. It is also not just for standard design bid build projects. This is widely used in progressive design projects. If you are an self, if you want to see the savings or you want the contractor to pocket the money. Biggest linear infrastructure projects in Canada, the Herb Gray Parkway, was delivered by using design, build, finance, main, and maintain, and a number of VM studies were conducted prior to the project award and over $120 million of cost avoidance and savings were identified. The Herb Gray Parkway was a complex project with many stakeholders and the value management workshops focused teams on balancing competing project objectives with costs in a way that was transparent and thorough. While the DBFM contractor optimized construction operations, material selection and economies of scale, the decision on alignment, cross section, connecting the community cross the expressway with land bridges and many other elements were made collaboratively with VM being used to focus attention on the key issues and decisions. The use of VM led to better and quicker decision-making when there was no agreement on alignment cross-section or whether the expressway would be in a tunnel or how to mitigate the impacts. The value methodology provides a cost-effective, time-bound and defined process to address these unnecessary costs with a proven track record of success. With the methodology properly applied, you can reduce capital cost, life cycle cost, design time, and decision time, while increasing quality, value, profitability, and ideas. Next slide, please. Why is this so? What are the secrets to success? First, there's the fact that more creative ideas can be generated by team than individually. This is not ad hoc not something done off the side of someone's desk. Because of the structured methodology, you follow a plan. As that the facilitated workshop help the team. This also works with stakeholders as well. If people are part of the solution and process, they will change. 
I've also seen benefits during environmental consultation when I've been asked if we considered various concepts and I was able to say yes and produce a workshop report showing how either an idea like theirs was considered or the multiple concepts that were considered. This structure also helps with executive buy-in and support, knowing confidently that things have been considered carefully for value for money. More importantly though, you really need to have an executive champion in your organization to make sure this happens. Maybe you can be that executive champion. Back to you, Rakesh. So there's so many techniques and innovation techniques and tools out there you're thinking, why value management? Again, going back to our question where we started with the lean risk management, Six Sigma, and so trees, and so on. So what value management does, it focuses on functions. It questions why it is needed and how we can achieve most outcome in the same resource possible. It does not compete with any other tools out there, but it complements by working together. So now, here we are. So starting value management needs, as Mike and I repeatedly talk about, executive understanding and support. Mike and I had one, many of them. Team of champions, dedicated team with willing to make a difference. Look at your projects or program you're involved in, exceeding budget other problems, business processes, stakeholder environment, competing interests, need for achieving common vision, value management can help. And finally, we are here part of Value Society. We all come from Value Analysis Canada and Save International and the public servant ourselves to help you in journey to understand the value management better. And more importantly, support you in your path to embracing value management and fostering innovation. Thank you very much. And Natasha, back to you. Thank you, Rakesh, and thank you, Mike. Um, we do have one question here, we're now gonna open it up for a question and answer period. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A um, section to um, ask any of your questions. So we have one here. Could you please share the web address where we can find the report about the studies made by MTO? Yes, so um, on, um the last slide that we displayed there, there's a web address that's uh, www.mto.gov on CAA um, slash English slash trans tech slash VE. At that location, you can find uh, the MTO reports. And uh, if for some reason you can't find the reports you're looking for easily, feel free to email me uh, at Mike Pearsall at outlook.com or um, you can also try me at, at mike.pearsontario.ca and I will be more than willing to share the MTO reports with you that we have uh, on our successes. Thank you. Does anybody else have any additional questions here? Oh, uh, when in a project, is it best to conduct a VA or VE? Yeah, th that's a great question. Uh, and uh, there's an opportunity curve, Mike and I always talk about. Uh, if you go early in the process and the project, you have more opportunity to make a change. Uh, but you also need some information to have a base case. So if you have a base case with a cost model, then you can compare what after value management you achieve. So it's earlier the possible, but when it goes to the planning, uh, premier design, detailed design and construction. Uh, if size and complexity of the project is big, it's a good to have multiple studies. Like uh, we mentioned about the example, one of the biggest projects we did, one in the planning, one in the design, but the focus of the value management study becomes different as we apply in the latest stages of the project. Next. Okay, the next question is, how do you manage to make people creative? And that's an excellent question as well. 
Um, as Rakesh outlined on the slide there, everybody can be creative. And one of the things, that, the beauty of this methodology is during the workshop, we have the ability to what I call a little bit of a almost forced creativity. Um, we get the multidisciplinary team together and people um, start brainstorming their ideas based on the functions. And you'll find that when you start brainstorming based on functions and people build off the ideas of other people in the workshop, that gets innovation into the room and starts making everyone creative in the room. And you may not believe it at first, it sort of builds on each other. And we also have a few tools in our toolkit as facilitators that when we get in with a crowd to try to encourage that creativity in the room and get it flowing. But it's amazing every time that we become people that thought they were not really that creative, didn't have a lot to offer, bring a load of information, a load of creative ideas and help the project out. So there are some tricks we've got, but really it's up helps that. Uh, next question relates to uh, uh, about uh, policy versus how we do uh, value management. It's a long question, uh, but the spirit of the question is we cannot see. Uh, it's a, having a part of the governance policy versus doing it and also selecting the team by the facilitator. You know, Mike and I have seen in both sides. Uh, Mike brought the example uh, in one of the slides that uh, policies from the US DOTs in our own backyard, Ontario Ministry of Transportation has policy governance uh, and the clear outline of which project uh, go through the value management. So it helps it, and it defines the executive champion, what we all talk about. Uh, uh, from the team selection perspective, uh, it's not up to one person or one lead team lead to select the value management teams. It's up, we worked together collaboratively with a project delivery team. We work with our agencies, multiple partners uh, in, during before the workshop starts to have which team member would be best uh, for this study, given the size and complexity of the project. So if a small project, we may need maybe three to five members from outside. If it's a complex project, we may need more uh, multiple uh, experts from other agencies. So we try to balance those. Hope this uh, answers your questions and uh, addresses some of your comments as well. Next. And, and you know, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So I just want to add a little bit to, to Rakesh's response on that one, that um, this is a dilemma that we have faced and does you do face this occasionally in industry. You have a team and, you know, it is best as shop to talk and have a sort of an organizational study about who can be involved and what you need involved. Um, however, you know, give me a team and I will work with that team. That's the beauty of the methodology of the structured workshop and the process you go through. But I, I, it is always nice to say to the owner or the, or the whoever owns the project controlling the project at that time that keep in mind, you'll get the best results if we have the best team. If you don't have the best team, you might not always get the best results. Um, and that's really what I say as a facilitator to them, say, you know, if you like, let me make a few changes to the team, we're going to get much better results. But we can still get results with the team you've given me. Uh, moving on to the next question. And uh, the next question is another excellent, which is how much of the project budget would we be allocated on average? And this depends on whether you're talking about the project budget of you know, the design budget or the overall construction and project budget. Um, typically, uh, for a large project, you know, for a VE study, you're looking, you prefer to have a five-day study um, workshop like that. Um, I could do a three-day workshop if I need to like that. Sometimes we can do even shorter workshops. And um, for a good-sized team, you may be looking at uh, upwards of $40,000 a day, depending on the, the study. And that may seem like a lot. However, um, we're typically seeing return on investments of at the low end, 50 to one, and generally more in the 100 to one or maybe even as much as 200 to one or more return on investment of how much time you spend or how much money you spend on the VE workshop versus how much savings you see in overall value improvement in the project. Um, so it's a very small amount in typical project budgets. Um, you really allow and over overall broad project budget for VEs. And your overall budget is, you know, $2 million. Uh, you might want to look at, you know, 
thousand dollars on on VE study, you might want to only you know do a, a one day VE study or a very abbreviated VE study for that project. If you've got something that's two billion dollars, you should consider, as Virkesh said about you know some of these large projects, multiple VE workshops through that, where you're going to spend only a very fraction, a, a one percent of your budget. Um, I've done many large projects, and uh, you know I'll, I'll say right now I'll, I'll I'll say to anybody out here you know. If you have a, a mega project and you're willing to give me 0.1% of the savings that we identify through a workshop, you know, I could live well off the rest of my life off that and I'm willing to take it. Nobody's taken me up on the offer yet though. Um, but like I said, I'd say no more than 10% and usually it's only a fraction of the project budget you're spending on VE with a great return on investment. Next question is focused on function analysis. Uh, and Mike, you presented a uh, number of slides on the functions, so I'll turn over to you. So um, function analysis actually really does make a lot of sense. And, and this is something, if you haven't tried in your life, it will really change your life because you need to start thinking always in terms of function. And it's really not, you know, what does it do? What must it do? And I talked about things, you know, we talked about the pencil, you know, where it actually makes marks. And then I can say, how else could I make marks? You know, in the pencil, I use lead and that, you know, which really, I guess, graphite, and that's making marks. But I can make marks with a marker, with a pen, with a piece of chalk. There's other ways to make marks. And that's what opens up to creativity. Similarly, think about the chair you're sitting on right now. If I asked you to improve a chair, people may say, well, I could add padding, I could add arms to it, I could do something with a back. The chair looked at from a function perspective, what is the function of that chair? That chair is to support a load. Then as an engineer, if I start saying things, I can also define things like how much of a load, how high do I need to support that load? At that point, I can ask my team, how, can I, how differently can I support that load at that height and that weight? And I may get ideas such as a swing. I might get ideas of a pendulum. I can get all kinds of different creative ideas, different solutions, because I've taken it back to that abstract form of what function do I need to achieve? You know, that is really important to start thinking your mind in the way of function analysis. And, and then we start defining some parameters around those functions at times as well. And, uh, you know, that's really important. Now, does it require bringing a cons consultant in? Yes, it does. You can think in terms of function, but you need to bring in a facilitator, a certified value specialist who's been trained in exactly what are functions versus activities. What functions do I need to find? What are the basic functions? What are the secondary functions? What are our necessary functions? You know, what are customer related functions? What might be cell functions? There's a number of different types of functions. We've just given you a very basic overview at this point in time. Um, but of course, when you bring in a certified value specialist, they're going to, you know, help you with those functions. Now, does it need to be a consultant? Well, it could be a consultant. That's one of the ways of doing it. In the case of, I work for the Ministry of Transportation, I'm a certified value specialist, we do some internal studies where you know I lead the study for our organization myself. So you can develop an internal resource if you want to do that, many places do. You can bring in an external consultant. There's a lot of ways to do this. If you'd like to talk about it more, certainly talk to Rakesh or myself and they can outline the alternatives and what we've done in the past, what we've seen others do in the past and find the best value for you and your organization. Thank you, Mike. A very comprehensive answer to very great and a comprehensive question. Thank you. So next question is what side of projects? So we always uh, talk about when we're writing the policy, Mike and I uh, were involved in uh, uh, updating our policy in our uh, ministry. So usually our policy and the other uh, agency around uh, North America policy usually 20 million, 20 to 25 million when you start the project, uh, usually recommended the value of the project, recommended for value management study. In some of the European agency do much lower. So, but it's not about only the value of the project, but uh, project can also benefit if it's less than 20 million value when it's a complex, when it has a complex, for example, bridge or a border. Uh, we worked on the border crossing, one of the project was less in the value, but it's a more complex because of a stakeholder competing interest because of the complexity related to uh, a stakeholder demands. How many times we see, uh, and that can also uh, benefit the project. So it's a combination of the value of project itself, but also other complexity related to a schedule, a risk, and so on. 
next question to Mike. Thank you. So the next question is another excellent question I, I, we get from time to time. And this is about the project team leaving after the information phase and uh, then returning at the presentation phase. And then in between you have external experts. And uh, you know, some people would have concerns about this approach. And you know, what do we see and what do we do? Well, this is a great one. So I usually say for best results, we do have an independent team. And that would be the situation where we have the project team or the team that's been working on the product or process or, or project uh, come in for the information phase, tell us all about it, and then they leave and we take a fresh look at it with that independent team. You know, the advantage of that is you have fresh eyes. You're not tied to things that have happened along the project. You're not tied to the same way of thinking back and you know, stage phase what you found. This is my preferred. It's not the only approach. Many times I've actually done the experience, the whole process just using the project team. So of the only one who's different to that team, I'm coming in and I'm working with the project team. Um, once again, can we get results? Yes, we can get results. Are they the best results? Not always the best results, but sometimes we have to do that. Particularly in a situation where you may be working with a proprietary product um, where there's you know, concerns about information sharing. And so you have no choice but to use the existing project team and just bring in a facilitator. And the facilitator will then try to walk that project team through and to get them to see it from a different perspective. It's not the best because I really do like to see that fresh out of eyes. I've also had situations that, that where we have maybe um, largely independent experts, but we keep a couple of key members of the project team through the whole study, particularly like the project manager or the, or the design engineer. And we keep them through the entire study process. So you have that link all the way through. That works really well for buy-in because that person has been part of the study and the workshop and they see how things were developed along the way. So this is another one where I always say before doing a workshop, it's a good idea to talk to your certified value specialist and do a bit of a workshop plan and see what fits for your organization, the culture around where you're dealing with it, and what's going to work for your project, process, or product. Uh, next question relates to value uh, management workshop. Uh, we talk about three to five days, but again, Mike and I talk about that the typical value management study uh, depends on the size and complexity of the project. It approximately takes between three to five days, but it doesn't have to be. We worked on the Herb Gray Parkway, one of the biggest project, multi-billion projects in Ontario Ministry of Transportation, and that was done over two weeks period because we also combine with the risk uh, management study as well. So if the project Project value and complexity grows, uh, yes, we recommend more than five days. And totally, you're right in assumption, uh, that may not be enough to achieve best value. If you have project value 5 billion, you want to have achieve most value for the project. And, and you want uh, more saving. You want to also look at the schedule. You also want to look at the constructivity. You want to also want to look at the reducing risk. And again, we repeat and repeat about the our partners, our stakeholders, um, partners uh, achieving uh, the best value for money, but also achieving the solution to the competing interest we have in the project. And we are looking at the time and we'll take two, that's the last question, what we have on the chart. And before I turn over to Mike, I just wanted to remind you our last slides, uh, resource are for you. Uh, this will be posted on the webinar. Uh, save International Resource, Value Analysis Canada. Mike and I both come from the Value Analysis and we're representing today. Also resource from the MTO and also uh, our contact, personal contacts are there. So anyone, uh, you're welcome to write us and we'll be happy to help you in your journey to fostering innovation. So Mike, back to you, last two questions. And to Natasha. Okay, so the, the next question uh, is what kind of contractual model do you suggest for a high value project? Now, there's a few ways to interpret this question. I'm gonna interpret for what sort of contractual model do I suggest for the VE component or the value management component? Certainly we can have a long discussion over what sort of overall contractual model. But for the value management component for the workshop, I strongly recommend for, in most cases, for a uh, basically a, a tender for a fixed you know, amount of a contract, right? Um, that we tender that and uh, you get a, a fixed budget for the project as a set ceiling on that. And uh, because it's a set workshop time and you have a set number of team members. Um, and that applies to almost any VE product project that I, I rec recommend that approach. Um, even with a very high value, large project, if you get into the workshop and you plan on a five day workshop, 
and you need some more time, it's better than to negotiate with the workshop team um, on a per diem rate to if does it come up though, because usually before we even start, we can get a, how much uh, time is going to be involved in that study. But that's how I'd handle that one. Um, and then for the day um, is another good question, which is said, I outline a typical process flow chart for value engineering. So in the case we, in this presentation, we focused on the, the middle six steps in the process. Um, there are, like I said, there are some eight steps as well. I mean, the, the, the eighth step at the very end is implementation. Uh, the step that at the start that we sort of skipped over is the sort of project scoping phase. And that is before we get to the information phase, this is the important part of actually deciding what sort of e study are we doing? How big is the team going to be? Uh, how long does the workshop need to be? Uh, so like I said, this we talked about having these sort of work, these sessions before you even start the process with the certified value specialist and some key team members to say, how are we going to run this workshop? You know, is it going to be a three-day workshop? Is it going to be a five-day workshop? Do we need to give the team a one-week break or two-week break in between part of the sessions to do some extra work or to get caught up on things? You know, is this going to be virtual? Is it going to be live? There are a lot of aspects to talk about in that pre-project planning phase and gathering stuff before we get to the actual workshop so that when we actually get the workshop, we start with our feet on the ground and head straight into it. It's a very active time. Um, we go then through the information phase, uh, which typically would last for uh, usually half a day, sometimes a day on a very complex project. Uh, next, I move into the function analysis phase. And uh, once again, if we're really pressed for time, we can do that in half a day. You know, I like to spend about a day on function analysis. It's very keen on deciding all the functions, getting those functions organized, getting the team to agree on how the functions interrelate. And once again, the, the actually diagram on the diagram and how they relate with each other aspect of it. Um, after function analysis, we move into the creativity phase. Um, I like to allocate um, to look at, you know, all the ideas and, and thoroughly. Um, often I like to, uh, to sort of start in, uh, you know, on an afternoon and then have some more the next morning so people have time to go home and sort of sleep on the ideas. And I, I find they're always fresh in the morning. Some, they, they thought overnight about something and they got some new ideas. Uh, after creativity phase, we go into evaluation. Um, typically I can do evaluation in about half a day. Um, Sometimes, you know, like depending once again the method and how many ideas you've got to evaluate, there's a number of different ways to go through that. You have to basically just pare down those ideas to what are the really good ones we're gonna work on. Uh, next is the development phase. Um, and this depends on what level you wanna develop the ideas to and how complex and how far and how you want to take them. And so that uh, allocate at least a day for development, sometimes a day and a half. Sometimes we actually give the team a break of a week or two weeks in between um, at that stage so they can take those ideas back and work them up in a higher level of detail, depending on the project and what you want to achieve out of that. Uh, and then we come back to the presentation phase. And the presentation phase is typically quite short, less than half a day. It might only be an hour because this is really just presenting the results that have come out of the development phase. Uh, and uh, you know, back to the project team or to the decision makers. Um, after that, we move into implementation. Implementation may actually involve a series of meetings with decision makers and owners and uh, follow up to implement the ideas and get decisions made on them. So that's a basic overview. Once again, uh, we could give a lot more detail um, um, if you needed to talk about a specific project. Thank you very much today for your attention. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, for us to do so. Back to you, Natasha. Thank you. I, you know what? We do have the one uh, question left um, uh, outlining a typical process flowchart for the value and for value engineering. Yeah, we addressed that. Yeah. Is that the one that you just? Okay, I just wanted yeah. to make sure. Yeah, thank okay, you. Okay, so I just wanted to thank you both, uh, Rakesh and Mike, for joining us today. Thank you so much for your expertise. Um, and for this presentation that I'm sure mo many have found extremely valuable today. As Rakesh and Mike have stated, there is more information here as you see on your screen. Um, feel free to um, contact them directly if you have any additional questions. And also just before everybody goes, um, I just wanted to let you all know um, 
that we are bringing you this presentation, this webinar today on behalf of the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. So we thank you all for joining. If you are not um, a part of OSPI, um, we are offering a 15% uh, off discount off of your first year uh, of membership. So you could just scan um, this QR code, or you can go to ospi.on.ca slash join and use this code here at checkout. Um, and you will be able to, you know, have access to a slew of webinars, a slew of presentations, certifications, and many other things that we offer that you will find of value as well. So thank you everybody for joining. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Again, thank you to Rakesh and Mike. Uh, for your knowledge, your expertise, and um, sharing your time with us today. So have a wonderful afternoon, everybody.